I speak to you in the name of God, source of all being, incarnate word, and Holy Spirit. Good morning. It's a really joyful thing for Sheila and me and for Stephanie and Joe and for Brian, all of we visitors, to be here with Trinity St. Peter's. Give yourselves a hand. I'm so proud of you. C.S. Lewis uh, said that that was not a sentiment that one should have, pride, in anyone, in your children, and so on, but he was wrong a few times, (laughs) and this is one of them. I was born under the star sign of Libra, and thus it's very hard for me to make up my mind about things, (laughs) to know whether things are really good sometimes or not so good. I usually can see both sides, and that's good, but not all the time. (laughs) So it is that theologically in the distant past and in the not so far past, the passions of people about theology, there's something really good about that. Back when the church was trying to decide about the nature of Christ, the nature of God, people used to have barroom brawls about the nature of Christ. We have actually, people have found scrawled in Greek in the bars of the uh, Hellenistic world, slogans from the Arian party, and what came to be known as the Orthodox Party about the nature of Christ, and blood flowed. That's the not-so-good part about it. But they cared. They cared about that. When I was a little boy in East Tennessee, my family and I made the journey all the way to Nashville to go hear the original Broadway production of Jesus Christ Superstar. And we had to go through picket lines to be able to, remember that? To be able to hear that amazing, that amazing piece of uh, music. I came here to be your bishop and I have learned about the history of our diocese. And as those of you who are um, long time Northern California Episcopalians know, one of my predecessors was tried for heresy in the House of Bishops and was censored by the House of Bishops because he had an insufficient belief in the virgin birth. What happened to him was not so good. But, Libra that I am, I think it was good that somebody cared. They paid attention to what he was saying. Just a few weeks ago, after the momentous moment that I will never forget, the DOMA and Prop 8, words from the Supreme Court, that morning I was in City Hall with a whole group of other people at 6.30 in the morning, and the sense of elation and completion, these are not things we always get to feel in our lifetime when we struggle for justice. Sometimes it is deferred so long that it's for another generation. But it was amazing to be there. And then that Sunday was the Pride Parade. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to the religious Episcopal contingent of the Pride Parade, uh, but we were number 230, group 230 in the parade. And... We were clustered with all the, may I say, uh, loosely, religious groups. So the Lutherans, they are religious, <laughs> were right in front of us, and we, were, we had Eucharist together, as we have been doing for numbers of years, right there on the sidewalk, uh, long before the march began. Uh, there were an extra, there were a million and a half people 
lining the streets, and so it was a long, long time before we started. But with us also were the humanists and the atheists of the Bay Area and Northern California, uh, all happily together. That's the good part about it. But there really was no sort of discussion between these groups, and that's the not-so-good part about it. Did we really care enough? Did they as well about their views? So the recently closed opera, Mary Magdalene, had its world premiere here in San Francisco. And Sheila and I were privileged to be guests in one of the evenings, and we were able to hear this extraordinary opera. Now, I realize it is an example of what we call elite or high culture, depending on how you want to look at it. And many, many people couldn't afford even the nosebleed seats in the War Memorial Opera House to be able to hear this, this opera. So I can't really speak to the reaction of crowds as had been done in the Aryan controversy or Jesus Christ Superstar or at the Pride Parade or with Bishop Pike. But this opera was full of potent ideas, potent theological ideas, many of which I thought were good in my way. But one of which was really something worth wrestling with, as far as I'm concerned. And that was all the way at the end of this extraordinary production, all of it written by one man, Mark Adamo, wrote both libretto and the music. And it was after the crucifixion of Jesus. And in this production, Jesus and Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene have married much to Dan Brown's satisfaction. <laughs> so they are intimate, let us say that. They love each other. And we know that. We, we know that from the gospel accounts. They, they loved each other. And Mary goes to the tomb, as in the canonical gospel story that we heard this morning. And she is weeping, she's sorrowing, but there is a body in this opera. It's a wax figure of the, of the actor who is singing the part of Jesus. But she is weeping at a physical dead body. And behind her rises Jesus, singing his gospel message to Mary. She never turns and looks at him. She never speaks back to him. She relates instead to the corpse and has, if you will, only a spiritual sense of the resurrection. Well, so what? So what? To me, brothers and sisters, this means everything. This idea, this reality, both things, the idea and the reality of the resurrection are decisive in our minds and hearts and in our world. They are worth struggling with. They are worth wrestling with because they make a difference. The idea, what we believe to be true, the Thomas theorem says, is true in its effects. We know that, right? What we put our minds to and wrap ourselves around with our beliefs affects our behavior and it becomes a kind of reality. People are affected by it. We are affected by it. It is not of no moment that we believe certain things. So, whether it refers to any kind of measurable reality or not, 
If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, it makes a difference in our behavior and how we comport ourselves and how we see other people. But the church says more than that. It says that that is actually how the universe is. That that is how reality is patterned. That the cosmos is shaped is shaped by a loving God who came to us in the human face of God as a particular human being who gave himself for this creation, was crucified, buried, and was raised to new life. So if that is so, in either aspect, in terms of an idea or the reality of the universe, what is the effect that it has? Well, today's gospel and the passage from Corinthians, the epistle, have something to say about that. This strange noli tangere, this strange thing where Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, don't hold on to me. Don't cling to me. Don't touch me. Because I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go and tell my followers, my friends, that I am going to my God and their God. And I'm going to my parent God and their parent God. That has meaning. She is not to hold on to him because, as St. Paul says in the Corinthians passage, we are no longer to see Christ. In the Greek, it would be translated more directly as according to the flesh. In our translation today, from a human perspective. But I like that, according to the flesh. Because that's how they had related to him. As a concrete person that they could touch and feel and to whom they related one on one and sometimes in a great crowd but not to the whole world not to the whole world it is only with this idea that he has become something beyond what he was as a fleshly human being that we move into a new reality where Christ is related to the entire world. So don't hold on to this particularity. It served its purpose. That flesh and that blood, that mind and that heart served their purpose. They showed us the human face of God. But in resurrection, which is not resuscitation, as C.H. Dodd said, we are moving beyond the body that we knew to another kind of body which can be related to everything and to all. So this is what Paul says. We no longer see each other, you and I, from a human point of view, from a fleshly point of view. We see each other through Christ. Now he says in another place, Behold, I am telling you a mystery. This cannot be summed up in a few words or even one image. So he tries several others. He says, Sometimes he says, We put on Christ like clothing, and then we see each other clothed in Christ. And then he says, because we see each other clothed in Christ, there is no longer a Jew or a Greek, a slave person or a free person, a man or a woman, but all we see in Christ. Now, may I say, he does not mean that the differences disappear, but rather, as in this Corinthian passage, that they are reconciled. They are related to each other, Jew and Greek, 
slave and free, male and female, all these opposites are brought to meaningful, loving relationship with each other and they continue to be what they were. We preserve our persona, but we relate to each other in Christ. And that's not even enough, is it? You don't get that, I don't get that. So he tries again. In Ephesians, he has this strange image, a biological image that is nowhere in biology. So we could say it's metabiology. And that is this. Each of us are growing up into the head which is Christ. So it's as if the starfish had a center and the legs, the arms, grew into it rather than growing out of it. And there, he says, we find our unity in this encompassing being, which is Christ, the resurrected Christ. So what what difference does that make? that I believe in that, that we as Christians believe in that. What difference does that make in our world? I think it is inconceivable to think of Gandhi without this resurrected Christ. I think it is inconceivable after Gandhi to think of Martin Luther King without this resurrected Christ. I think it is inconceivable after Gandhi and Martin Luther King to think about Tunisia without this resurrected Christ. Because this resurrected Christ is bringing, as Paul said, the ministry of reconciliation into the world, the overcoming of these things. Now, in the opera, to return to that, Peter, Mary Magdalene, and Jesus, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, are the primary characters. And Peter is a provocateur. And he says at one point to Jesus and Mary Magdala after they've been married, Jesus, you're interested in the body suddenly now that you have what you want. You've married the woman you love. So you're interested in the body, but you're not interested in the body of Palestinians who are suffering under the Roman Empire. Why don't you just be consistent and thorough in your thinking and a little more courageous, Peter says, and be willing to say that the body is not just yours and Mary's body, but the body of suffering people as well. Well, that kind of struggle had gone on for millennia before Jesus of Nazareth. Zealots lived at the time of Jesus and perhaps were among his followers, hoping he would lead them. That kind of struggle is known in the human world. But the struggle of nonviolence, where we see no longer an enemy, but one to whom we are in fact related, may I say through Christ, this is the ministry of that the resurrection brought into the world. And it is inconceivable for me to think of it without the resurrection. It opened the door to all that has flown, uh, that has come and sprung out of it afterwards. And then that brings me to tr- back here, to Trinity St. Peter's. You are together, and we will be marking that in a palpable, a tangible way in this service, in a beautiful way. But you are not the same. You retain your independence of personality as two different congregations, with two different histories, with two different ways of relating to Christ through the liturgy, relating to the world, but reconciled to each other. You are something new. May I say, 
you are a resurrected body. In Christ, you have become something beautiful, 